Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here, that you're moving, that you've already done so much today and you're going to do so much. We just invite that your presence just stay with us, that you be with us. We give you our attention, we give you our focus. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. That was awesome. Um, I, how many of you were here last year? So that was awesome. Um, I've just been carrying you guys with me for the whole year. Everywhere I go, I meet people and I tell them about what happened last year. Um, but one of the things that I felt this morning when we were in worship was if it just stayed here last year, then we didn't do it right. <laughs> If we, if we had what happened last year and it stayed here last year and we were hoping we would come back into whatever we left here last year, we didn't do it right. And I just was thinking about how different God is than any other God when it comes to worship. See, the gods of this earth and even the culture of the world is this. You sacrifice this to me and I'll do something for you. That's the God of this age. That's every idol. You do idol sacrifices, come here and I'll do this thing for you. You're sick, come do a sacrifice and I'll heal you. And if we bring that culture into Christianity, we're doing it wrong. Because what God says is, come, be with me, and then take me with you. If we come and we get something from him and we left him there, we're just like any other religion. And it's just like the, the air we breathe. I had this funny picture. I was down when we were bowing down and I mean, just the presence of God was fantastic. And I was like, Lord, what's this like? So I had this crazy picture. I'm going to share it with you. And then I actually have something to say, but <laughs> this is part of it. Um, I had this picture of being at McDonald's because <laughs> I've been at McDonald's like a hundred times. I feel like, especially with little ones, they love McDonald's. So it's like chicken nuggets, you know? And I felt like sometimes our, our worship to the Lord is like going to McDonald's, right? And all we want is the chicken nuggets. And the Lord's like the guy working at the register and we pay for chicken nuggets and he comes home with us, right? How many of us have gone to McDonald's? <laughs> we bought chicken nuggets and the guy working at McDonald's lives in our house now, right? That, that's uncomfortable to us. It would be uncomfortable, <laughs> right? If I went to McDonald's tomorrow and the guy hopped in my car and was like, I'm living with you now. But this is the God that we serve. We came sacrificing, thinking we were getting chicken nuggets and we got the whole package, and even when we walk through the seven steps and all of the things that we're doing, it's so wonderful when we hit that one step that says, where was Jesus in this? Because if we have healing apart from him, he's just a magic trick. He's just a vending machine. He's just an ATM. And then we get, we are, we're starving for something or we don't feel good. So we come into the presence of God and we say, oh, we know this, right? We sing a real happy praise song and we jump up and down and then he gives us what we want. And then we go away and we have a hard year and then we're like, oh, I need that again. But see, the way that God has designed it is we come into his presence and then he comes into us. And I was thinking about throughout history, there's just, if we, if we read the history of the Bible, there's just moments where you can see, I just sometimes feel bad for God, right? I don't know if we've ever thought about this, but because usually we... I mean, usually I'm feeling bad for me <laughs> when I'm coming to the Lord, like I'm like, I need, you know. But if we're reading through the history and we watch God, look at what happens in the garden. He sets up some one rule. Just don't eat from this one tree, right? Just one thing. And we could just be together. This is so awesome, right? Right, Adam? Right, Eve? This is cool. Just don't eat that tree, right? And then he eats it. And he's like, ah, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't think he said, ah, that's, that's my fleshly dad coming out. Like, come on. Then we see... Moses, right? He brings the whole children of Israel to Mount Sinai. The thing's on fire. God's super excited. There's flames everywhere. All the people of Israel are there. And then God's like, okay, I'm getting ready to have you come up to me. And they're like, no, it's okay. You stay there. <laughs> like, let Moses do the stuff and we'll just believe in you. You stay there, right? And then we even see in the New Testament when Jesus comes on the scene, right? All of the Pharisees, all of the religious people, they come to Jesus and they say, show us a sign right? Give us the stuff. They wanted the stuff, but they didn't want him. The Pharisees weren't asking that so they'd believe in him. They just wanted to see the stuff. And if we're not careful, we can get into that same place with worship. 
See, God is so generous. Even if we come with a wrong attitude, he's still going to pour out his love on it. He's just too much, right? We can come in with the most wrong motive ever, and the Lord's going to meet you and just slam you, right? That's how I met the Lord. I didn't even know him, and he moved on me and hit me. And I mean, I just fell to the ground, and I was like, I don't know who you are, right? I didn't come in with some right motive to get something from him. He just slammed me down. And I was like, I don't know who you are. I'm going to spend the rest of my life finding out who you are. <laughs> but we have to be really careful when we talk about things like worship or when we, when we experience worship. And even I was talking to Femi and when we were talking about what I was going to be sharing today, it's such like an overwhelming topic, the topic of worship. It's everything that we do. Once we're his, right? Who said that this morning? I think it was Samuel. When we were in the prayer room this morning, everything we do, when we go to the shop and we buy gum, or that other thing you said that I didn't hear what you said. Okay, yeah. <laughs> when we go to the shops, everything we do is worship. So I'm just, I just took three observations. We're just going to talk about three things today. It's going to go as quickly as possible because I just want to keep the schedule and I want to honor Pastor Craig and I want to honor your hungry stomachs, right? But when, I, when we're talking about worship, it's such an expansive thing. So I just want to make sure we know that when I'm talking, this isn't the entirety of worship and I'm just going to sum it all up for you. It's, it's a lifelong journey. Amen? But let's be encouraged that this year when we come to him and we come into his presence and he shows himself in a mighty way and he gives us something like healing. I believe there's people in this room that have things going on in them that Pastor Craig touched on last night. The Lord's going to touch those things and he's going to heal them because he's good. Remember when the 10 lepers came to him? He healed all of them and only one came back, right? And Jesus was like, hey, where'd the other nine go? <laughs> you know? And it doesn't say that Jesus took the healing back. <laughs> you're leprous again, right? He's just so generous. Like there's people here that are going to get, you're going to get healed of wounds this week, even if you don't do it with a perfect heart, just because he's that generous. And when you hear the revelation and the truth of the word, it will set you free. But it's not just for that freedom that you're here. It's for a lifestyle. He wants to set you free on a daily basis, working out our salvation. Amen. This takes effort. This takes, everyone's been saying that. I love that. It's like the four letter word of Christianity, work. <laughs> Is it going to work? We have to work? I thought we're under grace. You know? We have to labor. Paul says, work out your salvation. Right? We enter in through the threshold, but then the Lord starts working on us. Okay? You guys all right? <laughs> all right, we'll go through this fast. This came to me again this morning. I love this, Isaiah 55. Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, amen, preach. <laughs> Sorry, that's just an inside joke with myself. Come, buy and eat. <laughs> come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Right? Why are we laboring for things that will never satisfy, right? We, we, just heard, we just heard Julia talk about this. Why do we give ourselves to the things that won't fully satisfy? Why do we link our hearts to things that don't fully satisfy? I love this. What does he say next? Listen. Oh, here, look. Why spend money on... You guys, I'm sleepy. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good. The answer is not like, oh, buy this other bread that's way better or spend your labor on this other thing. He says, come to me and listen to me. So part of what happens in worship, when we're worshiping like we did this morning, there's an invitation. We, I mean, it just was glorious, right? We were just looking at Jesus this morning. You could feel that we were in the throne room and then Sereka read Revelation 4 and I might read Revelation 5 and we'll just keep reading through the book of Revelation. But we're, we're, you can feel that throne room experience and there's an invitation at that moment. We can look at him and we can distance ourselves and say, that's really great and this is an amazing moment and I'm feeling like the feels. Is that what people say? <laughs> I've heard people say, all the feels. That's right. Um, and we can leave it at that or it's an invitation to say, I, I want you. <laughs> what you have, I want it and I want it for the rest of my life. And so there's an invitation every time we worship together, every single time. There's not one time. Prayer room in the morning, worship this morning, worship in the evening, 
You know what I mean? There's, it's every time is an opportunity for encounter with the Lord. And he will never leave you the same. If you ask him to come, he will come. My confidence is in this, that anytime his people come together and they call upon him, he shows up. Every time. There's few things I can say that about, right? I can't say that every time someone's going to speak, it's going to change my life, right? But I can say every time the presence of God shows up, I will be changed. If I will let it. If only for a moment even, because he's just so gracious. You know, I can't stand. I, we were talking to, there's a, um, there was a student, he was here last year towards the end. His name is Jerome, and we were having a conversation. He was talking about how people get healed, and he gets so bummed out when people get healed, but then they turn away from the Lord. He was getting really bummed out about this. And I was like, no, this is the generosity of God. Right? We can come in with a super wrong motive and he's still going to pour out his spirit on you. That's who he is. But I just want to encourage us as a group to, this week to engage and say, I'm taking you home with me. Right? I don't want just the nuggets. I want the person behind the counter coming home, riding in my car, going all the way. Isn't that a crazy? I was like, what is that, Lord? Why are you talking to me about McDonald's? Fantastic. I have eight minutes. <laughs> I, set an I set a timer for myself. Okay, I'm just going to share these three things, and hopefully I can break down maybe one or two of them. I think that it's something we could walk away with, and if you guys want to spend some time digging down deep into it, I encourage you to. Um, and again, these are just three observations. This isn't the whole entirety of worship. I just get overwhelmed when I think about worship because it is everything. I could say everything and then it, or just leave it like that, but I feel like we need to touch some things. So worship is about dwelling, right? There's something about music. I don't understand it. It's mysterious, and it's okay that there's some mysterious things in our lives. We should have more mystery. We should have more things happening in our lives that we just can't explain. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> I don't know why when I prayed for that person, they fell over, you know, like, those are things, there's no, there has to be some things in this God who's bigger than us that has to be bigger than us. If not, we could explain anything and he would be a God, right? I love Tozer says, we've made God in our own image. God made us in his image and we've returned the favor. That's what, that's what the thing is. And now we're making you in our image. So worship is about dwelling, amen? Worship is about dwelling with God, having the not yet now. It has always been on the heart of the Father to dwell with his people. I'm going to read Revelation 5 very quickly. You guys okay? You guys awake? You guys hungry? <laughs> That's all right. The Lord will use natural hunger to awaken your appetite to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Revelation 5. This is, this is a worship service in heaven. Right? We had this this morning. It was like straight out of the Bible. On earth as it is in heaven. A lot of times we use that as like a, a, you know, when we're about to have a healing service. On earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray for people to get them healed, you know. But on earth as it is in heaven, the atmosphere of heaven on earth. So what they're doing there, we want to do here. And that includes worship. That includes enthroning Jesus in the center of everything we do. Amen. So I'm going to read this really quickly. Stay with me. Um, Revelation 5. Then I saw at the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or, under the, or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. <laughs> Bible man. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. And then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. What? Right? I don't know if we fully understand what happened when Jesus came on the scene. It was always in the heart of the father. But even the angels didn't know what was going on, right? It says there were things, there's still things hidden from the angels that's been revealed to us. That's another sermon for like another day. 
Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing on the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and he, he had seven horns. We, we don't have time to get into this. <laughs> he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures that Sareka was talking about earlier, and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, another sermon, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, right? This is heaven. It's not just a good idea that men made up to have good church services. This is the culture of the kingdom that you've been born into. This is the air we breathe. This is the economy of heaven. This is how things get done, right? God reveals something to us. We pray it back to him and he acts. Th that's the economy of heaven. It's how it works now. And, and it's not the, the economy of this earth, which is I pay you lots of things and you do something for me. We can still carry that into Christianity. But Lord, I did all this stuff. How come life's not working out <laughs> like I thought? I did all the stuff. And he's like, you missed it. You have everything. You have me. Anyway, I had, this, I had this picture one time for someone. I was praying for them. No, that's not right. It was about me. Yeah, amen. That feels better. I was asking the Lord for an answer to something, and I, I saw this door. And I opened the door, and Jesus was there. And I kept looking behind him like, is there something else behind this door? Because <laughs> I was asking for an answer and you just showed up. The Lord wants to be our answer, amen? Jesus is the double, right? That we prayed about, that we sang about this morning. Jesus is the provision. He's not the one that brings the provision. He's not the one that gives the provision. He is the provision. Jesus is healing. He's not just the one who heals. He is healing, right? And Jesus isn't just one who gives salvation. He is salvation. He says to us, this is eternal life, that you would know me. Jesus says this, not Ryan, don't know me. Who cares about me? Know Jesus, right? Eternal life is in the man. So be encouraged. You guys are right? So Jesus... This is the heavens worship, right? And they sang a song because that's what you do in heaven. Jesus shows up on the scene. He reveals himself. And the, and the response is this. You are worthy. They're singing it. <laughs> you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. I'm sure it's a great song. I'm not, I don't know the tune yet, um, but I will one day, right? Because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to, see, to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This is great. This is the song of all of the people, right? And then it says, Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels. Now the angels are singing. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Amen. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth singing. It's just getting crazy. There's something about what we do in worship and singing that reflects the kingdom. It's so much more than just an emotional experience. It's a revelation of who he is. And we have opportunity, like we did this morning, to gather around the throne and see Jesus and sing with the angels and the elders and the multitudes. Amen? So worship is about dwelling. Oh, yes, I have one minute. <laughs> that was put on myself. I put that on myself. No one put that on me. Worship is about dwelling. Dwelling cannot happen in a service or a moment, right? If I'd said I dwell with my wife, but I was only there once a year, you'd be like, no, you don't. You dwell in all those other places. <laughs> you do not dwell there, right? Dwelling cannot happen in a service in a moment. It cannot happen even in a week. You can have a glimpse of what dwelling would look like if you actually dwelt there, right? Camp this week is like visiting a place that you could live. This isn't just a high. This is like a glimpse of where you, oh, you could buy this place. If you wanted to, you could live in this place. You don't have to just visit it on vacation and have a holiday in God's house. You could actually dwell in it. And that's what worship's about. Amen? Amen. So take a look around this week. See if you like this place. Right? Check out the furnishings. Drink the water. Eat the food. Right? I'm talking spiritually. 
You could drink that water and get up with you. But check it out and see if you want to buy this place. Move in. Worship is about dwelling. You cannot tell me you dwell here if you don't dwell here. Don't come and tell me you're a Christian if you're only a Christian one week a year. I don't understand that. That's not mean. That's just true. Amen? <laughs> that got heavy for a second. We're all good, though. It's always been God's desire to be with us from the garden to the tabernacle in the desert to the temple he built to the believer that is now the temple. All of us have the Holy Spirit living in us. And then at the end in Revelation, it says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Amen. He will have his way. Two more. Worship is about seeing. There's something that happens in worship and in singing. It can happen outside of this place, but there's something that happens. We come together as the body or when we're by ourselves that we can sing and see who he is. Right? One scripture that goes with that, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. When we see him, we are made like him. Amen? There's an exchange there. Our heart to look after him and to find him. When we come and we're singing, we're not just singing songs. We're actually trying to find him. Right? And then when we find him and we look at him, something happens to us. Amen? Last point, and then I'm going to turn this over to Pastor Craig. Is that right? Anyone? Yes? Okay, all right. Worship is about knowing. Just like I said before, John 17, 3, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I just love this because we're going to talk about the seven steps. I love this about who Jesus is. Just a couple revelations of who he is, and it's out of his own mouth, right? Revelation 1, 8, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Revelation 22, 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Do we see this? The first and the last, the beginning and the end. Isaiah 44, 6, Old Testament. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. And the reason I wanted to talk about knowing this God who was, who is, who was, and who is to come is because he is this God, that's what gives him access to your past. Right? When Pastor Craig is having a... You know, he shared the story with us last night of Jesus being in that garage, right? That's not just a figment of his imagination. It's reality. Because of who God is, because of the revelation we have of him in worship, we can know that he is the God who is right now very present with us, who was and who is to come. He has access to every bit of our life. Amen? Amen. And it's in these times of worship that we come together and we see him high and lifted up and we hear him say things or we sing things like, you are the one who was and is and is to come. Then we have a revelation of like, oh my gosh, you have access to this painful moment. I can say, where were you? And you can show me exactly where you are. It's not just our brain inventing it, right? It's the Lord saying, this is where I was. And he's present with the pain, amen? You guys all right? You good? Okay, cool. I'm going to pray. Is that okay? That was like a fire hose. If you want to know more of that, <laughs> that was a lot. We got to it. Jesus, we thank you for worship. We know it's so big. Oh, that was the other thing. When Julia said the thing about um, inclining, um, worship, the word actually can be translated as bending, bending toward. Um, and in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, you, when it says worship, that same word can be bend, like to bend toward. So, Lord, we ask that you would bend us, that you would allow us to bend into you, into your way, Lord, where we're going our own way or where we've gone an opposite way. Lord, this week, would we bend toward your way? Would we know your worship as a place of a dwelling? Would we know your worship as a place that we can finally see? when all the noise of the world has gone away and we can see you clearly, and when we know your presence as a place of knowledge of knowing you and understanding who you are. In your name, Jesus. Amen.